From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars, pop culture, and the ultimate adventure, life itself. I'm Ken Napsok. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. And I'm Jennifer Landa. And we are here staring into cameras on video, talking low and rainy into our microphones. It is a <laughs> uh, stormy day in Los Angeles, but we're here to talk about uh, someone who uh, we lost last week. Uh, shocking, uh, sudden. Uh, but also, just what a legacy. We're going to celebrate Carl Weathers and Grief Karga, uh, among uh, other things here on Force Center today. Before we get into that, we're going to take care of some of the housekeeping we normally do, including the fact that today's episode is brought to you by Audible. Uh, you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day tr- free trial at audibletrial.com slash Force Center. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. A little bit later, we'll have our Force Center recommends an audiobook we think you should try out on us. We also have some announcements. Fun housekeeping. Joseph, Jennifer's warming up in the bullpen to... Take this announcement home, but why don't you kick it off? I made two separate sports references. <laughs> Bullpen for baseball, kickoff for football. Okay, I'm going to hurl the ball and lash it, right? Those are that, those are sports absolutely. terms, right? The whole <laughs> hurl and lash. I don't know what sport that's from, but it sounds fun. Uh, yes, we do. We have some announcements. We got a lot of uh, stuff cooking. And the first thing is that quite a while back, uh, before the uh, the times of the strike, uh, we had a, a goal on our Patreon, and if we reached it, we would have a uh, a new Jennifer Landa show on YouTube, and that is going to come into full fruition. Jennifer, do you want to talk a little bit about Jedi Beat? Sure. Uh, I did the Jedi Beat and also Happy Beats back in the day, and it's kind of like an NPR meets Star Wars style show. I'm diving deep into the history, for example, of the Mos Eisley Cantina and how that came about, some of the the problems, the costumes. Um, I'm also tackling, tackling some of the weirder things in Star Wars. Mark Hamill and a gold lame suit is one of them. (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to explore a lot of fun topics on this show. Hashtag not my Luke, I'm sure, spread on (laughs) the imaginary social media that existed in those variety show days. Uh, That's great. And uh, we are thrilled to finally announce that it is going to be debuting Jedi Beat on YouTube with pictures and everything on Monday, February 19th. And then it will continue every Monday for five weeks total. Yes. That's right. Very excited for the series. Uh, this is some of the, the best stuff we've had out there the, in the 10 years of Force Center. But, Jed, this is this has gone from why don't you take the audio, put some pictures to you, you. You've almost described to us off air as it's it's a brand new ball game, huh? Basically, I've re-recorded it and re-recorded it. Um, I'm also adding new music to make sure that we don't get flagged for any issues. <laughs> uh, adding video clips, finding those old video clips. Uh, yeah, I'm approaching it like a mini documentary. So this is like the the show of Theseus. You have slowly replaced every part of it. So it is a philosophical question if it's the same as the audio episodes. <laughs> yeah, actually. And I had to update some things, too. That was really interesting. I'm oh, like, yeah. oh, that's changed. That's so. right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, we're excited for that. Look for that on our YouTube channel uh, Monday, February 19th. Uh, that is one thing coming. But also we want to update you on, uh, well, update. We don't announce some. It's not an update. This mm-hmm. is an announcement, actually. Let's get that right. 007 Center. That's right. We've been kind of, every once in a while, this comes up. We tease it. We say maybe we should. Well, we're absolutely going to do this. This is a, a Force Center look. Uh, it's going to be Joseph and myself doing a review and discussion of the Daniel Craig Bond series. And we're going to begin with 2006. That number is unreal to me. 2006 Casino Royale. Uh, this is going to be the Force Center kind of a style you're, you're used to. We're going to take our, our, our Force Center gaze, if you will, and put it on Daniel Craig coming out of the ocean in, in Bond <laughs> shorts and talk about this movie and start launching the series. It's going to be available to all of our Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash Force Center. Or we're trying out something new. I like this feature. I think this is interesting. There is a shop option on Patreon, which means if you're not a Patreon, on supporter and we know a lot of people um you know either you, you just can't support every month we understand that or you've been there and dropped out yeah yeah or you just don't want to i mean there's don't a lot want of to. Yeah. subscription <laughs> uh we, we are being uh subscribed to the gills as yes. a as a model so i understand for yeah. some people it's just like i just don't want another thing so i would like to make 
a one-time purchase of things I enjoy. That's right. A one-time, as I say in a flight attendant style, available for purchase will be an audio or video version on our Patreon page uh, shop. And uh, this episode will be coming your way February 12th. I stopped, Joseph, because I thought you said something. Maybe you did. But this is not, last night, I, got a, I was in my office, and I heard Grace, and, and I went out and said, did you say something? And she... Had headphones on. She hadn't said anything to me. So I'm starting to hear voices in my head. It's, I, thought you, <laughs> I thought you said a full sentence. Well, uh, we'll anyway. do Ghost Center eventually as well. Uh, we're getting uh, there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're close. Fun. We're close. Yeah. <laughs> but anyways, that's uh, the big announcement. 007 Center. Jedi Beat all on the way. Uh, before yes. we dive in. Yes. yes. One other thing. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, that we added to the announcement center. Well, first, I just want to say really quickly about 007 Center. This is a like a dream come true for me i mm. i love james bond in general i have always loved that ken loves the daniel craig bonds as well and I'm, mm. one of the reasons i'm really excited to take this on is i'm uh totally obsessed i i've read the actual novel casino royale probably about 17 times no exaggeration mm. so me seeing that film in 2006 was seeing it through the eyes of that novel and Ken, you're mostly you've seen a couple of james bond films but you're mostly on board for the daniel craig so this is the kind of conversations I crave where you and I have a lot of similar interests, but we're going to be coming at this movie in that era from different perspectives where you primarily have a relationship with Daniel Craig in those movies uh, while I am uh, absolutely saturated <laughs> in yeah. James Bond. Sorry for the gross word choice, but it's true. <laughs> no, absolutely. I I, I was a Daniel Craig Bonder. I, I was a Pierce Brosnan Bonder for a little bit, but uh, that's a lot of that has to do with the video game. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do uh, love uh, GoldenEye, actually. I think it's a good film. Uh, to, uh, you know, but that, yeah, it's going to be fun to discuss what brought me and pulled me into that series with that movie at that point in time. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, we're recording it this week, and then uh, it will be available on February 12th. And then the other thing that we wanted to be sure to mention is uh, we have decided to re-release uh, the entire catalog of Databank Brawl, uh, one episode at a time. Uh, the episodes, the original episodes are, we started in, in 2016, and they are absolutely buried. You will break mm -hmm. your wrist trying to get <laughs> to the bottom of our thousands of episodes. So we decided why not just uh, re-release them. So uh, every Sunday, just on audio, just on podcast, we are re-releasing our old uh, comedy fighting show, Databank Brawl. Yeah, it's been fun to pull the files, uh, kind of re-upload them, and uh, just hear already the things we're, we're getting right and wrong in terms of the future <laughs> of Star Wars for 2016. Now, probably not unlike, Jen, what you've discovered with Jedi Beat. Yeah. Another era. <laughs> Another era, that's right. Another era indeed. Well, that is the uh, housekeeping. We thank you all for your support. Uh, before we get to the main thing, I guess we'll catch up with Star Wars Life Adventures. Uh, it's hard to have life adventures when you're uh, reined in, and it's it's been um, uh, it's it's not just a jokey. Wow, it's raining in Southern California, and we got to put on beanies. It it's it's dangerous in some parts of the city, to be uh, frank. So uh, we, we're it, at, at, at the time of this recording. A Monday morning. I, I've not seen a break in the rain since about lunchtime yesterday, Sunday. So it's been kind of crazy. But uh, any any life adventures, Jen, can found in the uh, the, the rainy days. Mm, rainy days are difficult with two children going stir crazy. We got so mm. desperate. Uh, I've been doing a deep dive into Gem and the Holograms, the eighties cartoon and doll line uh, from back mm -hmm. in the day. And my my daughter saw it, saw me looking at it. She's like, "What's that?" I'm like, "Oh." Oh, you want to see? And so she watched the theme song and she watched the theme song about 20 times. I'm not exaggerating in a row. She's like, again, <laughs> click. Oh my, I, it's a Once great theme the song. Round. Yeah, yeah wow. it's a great theme song. So then I was excited and I'm like, well, it's raining. They're desperate for content. So I'm like, let's watch the old gem show. Uh, it was on Tubi. The audio mixing was a little weird. It didn't have the same thing. And about halfway through, they're like, can we change it to something else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, all right. Theme doesn't song. Hold up. The song. Yeah, doesn't hold up. Just the song. But I, the idea of glitter and glamour, fashion and fame was very appealing to my eight-year-old. And that is the truly outrageous, right? The it is truly, 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 truly outrageous. <laughs> which you heard 20 <laughs> times. Truly outrageous times 20. I loved amazing. it. The music's great. I mean, really, like, it's all about the music videos. Like, they really yeah. went all out for their music on that show. It was a time. It was, it was a, time, a time, children. <laughs> That's right. Right. That, that was my life adventure. Nothing Star Wars related, though, unfortunately. I mean... 
look, Gem Gem Center is an entire other country, <laughs> so don't worry about that. Uh, Joseph, you uh, survive in the rain, the other part of the city. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so far, we'll see if the power cuts out suddenly. Uh, that will be an interesting episode. Uh, mm -hmm. I think my only real uh, Star Wars adventure is some action figure management. Uh, another appearance on classic Doctor Who that I'm watching of a uh, of a Star Wars actor, uh, David Prowse, uh, Darth Vader was a Minotaur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> an episode of <laughs> classic Star Wars that I was watching. That was fun. Uh, the life adventure that was really fun uh, this weekend was uh, my wife wanted to look at a antique store for some furniture. And I was then I was like, hey, that's great. Let me look around for what else is near there. And there's a store called a video tech that is a it sells a couple things, but it's a video rental store of mm. uh, DVDs and Blu-rays. Uh, there's wow. also videots in the city, which I've never been mm -hmm. to. Uh, but man, it, this isn't just like clinging to nostalgia for nostalgia's sake. Mm -hmm. It was really great to to go through a video store and. They've got everything organized by actor and by director and by genre. So it's a very it's organized in a very specific way. There, it's obviously curated. So there's like tastes being presented to you. But it was so great to have it be physical and tactile and not like Netflix being like, I think you should watch this. You specifically. We think we know what you like to 97 percent. And I'm only going to show you this. And also, I'm going to insult you by showing me something I really do like and then saying, 56% match like mm -hmm. I got I got mad when Clone Wars was still on Netflix because like I'd watched it like seven times and it still was like 98% match like what do I need to do to get to 100 <laughs> Netflix what I need to get to but uh it was really really fun to just kind of have that physical in the world experience of mm -hmm. picking what you want to watch rather than the digital interface yeah I love it. Yeah, there's a store down the street for me that I know a lot of people are, are starting to talk about that uh, every time I walk by it, I'm like, man, I should just pop in and see what I can rent on tape. I couldn't play it, <laughs> but I'll rent. Mm, Imagine it up. It's so important. Oh, uh, so lovely, important. lovely. Yeah. Well, and you know why? It's because yeah. like the it, the immediacy of everything, right? Like of Netflix, mm -hmm. you don't like, you know, mm -hmm. my kids say, I don't want to watch Gem. Let's watch something else. When we were kids, it's like you go to the video store, you spend all this time. You're like, I think this is the one you <laughs> put it in. You're like, it's not great, but I rented it. So now I got to watch it. And maybe gotta... sometimes you might like yeah. it in the end. Yeah, I mean, maybe yeah. things would have turned around if your daughters had made it through, Jim. <laughs> you know? I know. I'm trying to get their uh, text, you know, attention span up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How about you, Ken? What adventures do you have? Uh, nothing, nothing super exciting. Just trying to get my life in order. Uh, thank you to a lot of people who've. Uh, it, we're all. Everyone I know is going through stuff. I'm just. It's my turn on the. Uh, will he break? <laughs> wrote, wheel spin the game show we're all playing. And I think last week was uh, last couple weeks a bit. But I, I had a lot of support. I'm, I'm also. Not, I won't get it. I will not get into details. But I, I've had some. Some old friends reach out that are old friends for a reason. But they've reached out in such a supportive way that I have to. Dig deep and find out what a Star Wars. Uh, teach me about redemption from the other side you mm. know uh mm. if, if 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 darth vader became anakin and survived and and lands on endor <laughs> with luke and everyone he's like hey <laughs> hey everybody i'm back i'm so happy for you all i've had a what do you do <laughs> what do you do uh and that's kind of what's going on with me um so i won't go into details but it's been uh it's funny i yeah star wars is Star Wars is everywhere. That's why we talk about it in this way. So, um, but on that, surviving the rain, hanging in there. Back's feeling better. Thanks for some people occasionally tweet to me. How's your back? I've had a bad start to the year, but I I'm, I'm getting better. And all of you out there who've <laughs> had a bad start of the year, you're going to get better, too. We're going to get through this together. Yup. There you go. There's Coach Ken. Yeah. <laughs> I'm motivated. There you now, you and now he's going to sell us a vitamin supplement, I think. I think it's all That's it's right. building up to a vitamin supplement pitch. <laughs> right, right. Or the thing I've seen a lot more now. You don't wear shoes. Shoes are bad for you. So get these shoes that have no support and then you'll build support in your feet. I, these commercials are popping up all the time. I want to scream because I, I have bad feet too. So maybe I should get these shoes as well. <laughs> well have you seen these shoes? You haven't seen these commercials no. yet? <laughs> no. no, I have not. Yeah. I'm watching the wrong. Uh, what channel are you seeing the. You, uh... it, it's YouTube. <laughs> Oh, it's YouTube. It's, it's oh, YouTube. YouTube. So, so oh. it means it's a uh, you know it's probably I don't know what happened at some point. Um, I wa I know I watched a TikTok of uh, youngsters 
who's on TikTok, who ne- there's a trend where they cut out the bottom of their shoes because they like to go barefoot everywhere. And mm. so they it looks like they have shoes on, but they're barefoot. Oh my god. Don't there's a lot of questions, and believe me, people in the comments are asking these questions. Um, <laughs> and then that maybe maybe that triggered it because now I'm getting it's this. These two workout people, I think they're from Australia. I don't want to. Insult, I, they're, I think they're from down under, and they're just like, don't wear shoes, but if you got to, wear these. It's like tissue on your feet. Your feet need to build muscles. Urgh, and it's it's all I see right now. And I'm like, what's going on with my feet that I see these commercials? There's a similar rage for the shoes with very little support that also separated all your toes. That's you what I was those? thinking of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had a friend who wore those all the time. They're like socks, <laughs> including with- formal events. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. With formal events, they wore them before. Oh no! There was an engagement celebration, and he showed up at him. We we're like, Tom, what do you know? Was it a joke? Put your toes together for this one. Oh my! What God. if What if I just did a TikTok that claimed that it is a big thing with Gen Xers to wear pants with the the back cut out? You know, just for convenience. Would it get picked up and a bunch of people say, "Look yep. at all the Gen Xers doing this"? Or would it just be like this this one yeah. weird a hole with like eight hundred TikTok <laughs> followers claims that would I be found out or would people just pick it up and go, "Yep, Gen Xers yeah. are all cutting the butt out of their pants." It's- There's only one way to find out. Let's start cutting. Let's start yeah. cutting. For Gen Z, then everyone would want to be on that trend. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's yeah. true. That's true. Mm-hmm. Generation makes a difference. Yeah. 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 Well, we're having some fun. We're laughing. We're catching up. We're reconciling a, a full world and range of emotions. And that's going to be part of our conversation going forward here. Uh, Joseph, is, uh, uh, you had this. Uh, we had another show planned. And then this sad uh, uh, passing of Carl Weathers happened. And, and you emailed us and said, we, we've got to honor this man and this character. So, Joseph, we're, we're going to begin that journey here right now. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, it was a real shock, and it, I think uh, obviously uh, uh, fans of his entire career and fans of Star Wars were deeply affected. So it just seemed right to spend the episode talking about uh, the man and the character uh, who means a lot to us as Star Wars fans. Uh, Carl Weathers, athlete, actor, director, uh, passed away at the age of seventy six. Uh, I think all three of us loved his work throughout his career, but. Uh, developed an even stronger connection through his uh, multifaceted work on the Mandalorian. Um, we, you know, not only uh, the acting, but also the directing and the great insightful behind the scenes comments on all of the various Disney gallery documentaries. So we are going to talk about all that. We're going to celebrate Carl Weathers and we're going to celebrate the character of grief Karga. And we're going to start with the big picture. Uh, Ken, why did you love Carl Weathers. What was so magnetic about him as an actor and as a, a human in in the public eye? We're going to get to some of the roles that made him famous, and and, and I think he's a multi multi generational star, right? There's mm-hmm. a lot of different generations who found him in different ways. But I'll, I'll go. Um, but sadly, we can now say it at the end is is, is he was. Uh, I'll say, despite his age, what I mean by that is sometimes I have some people in my life who are in that age group, the mid seventies, and they're kind of like, I'm done. And I'm like, yeah. You, you don't have no. You're not. You're not. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I look at, at Carl Weathers, who certainly had a, a bit of a resurgence with the character of Grief Cargo in terms of an acting role. He even was saying some of the stuff like, "I was kind of done. I, I, I thought it made me direct, and, and they put me in the show." Type of type of vibe. Um, but he was still tweeting. He was still uh, uh, engaging and fighting and, and and involved in issues and shared his truth and the hashtag be peace and. All those things. He was still, you know, he was retweeting or, or liking posts from our buddy Bri Ward about a grief cargo Photoshop and stuff like that. He was, <laughs> he was out there. He was in it. He definitely from a distance seemed larger than life. And then in his passing, you've seen all the, um, you know, the posts from the people that worked with him, especially in the Lucasfilm uh, uh, era. Uh, the heartfelt posts, uh, and, and look, when anyone passes, it's that we, we saw this with, with Ray Stevenson too. It's you know, uh, the connections, the bonds. He he was larger in life too. But but Carl had uh, just I don't know. Just I was so happy. And we were there in 2019 in Chicago. So happy to have Carl Weathers in Star Wars. And when he walked mm-hmm. on stage, and there was a little bit of like, whoa, remember that 2019? You you were there with me, Joseph. Like mm-hmm. when he walked out. It was. This is a guy who's done a lot and been in front of a lot of people in his life, and even he felt that energy and felt that uh, uh, you know, just hitting him right in his chest. And it was, uh, it was a wonderful time. So just there's an, an energy, uh, an, an engagement, and an, a, and a just a, 
a vibrancy that was mm -hmm. very clear that we all fell in love with fast or re fell in love with fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jennifer, for you, what did you love about him? I think what I loved was that he was very much old Hollywood, like you're saying, Ken. Like he was just had this charm and ease about him that if you've ever seen or met any celebrities from, you know, the 50s, 60s, 70s, even the 80s, they just have this like coolness, right? They've been around, they've seen it all. But at the same time, he's inspiring because he was so, like you're saying, Ken, involved with Twitter and embracing technology. And he seemed like he was having the time of his life at yeah, every yeah. event that I've seen him <laughs> at. I saw him at the Mandalorian uh, press event when they first, they first mm. showed it. And he just was on stage just having fun. He was just mm. happy to be there. And immediately it was just like, oh, I, I can relax because you're relaxed. And mm -hmm. it just was really, mm -hmm. it was really wonderful. He seemed like yeah. such a mm. such a magnificent person. Um, and I would have loved to have met him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really agree with everything you're both saying. And I think pointing to his his uh Twitter presence is, is a powerful part of it. Um, I think just on like the most surface level as a performer, and and he brought this to Grief Carga, it's such a unique mix of sort of uh, old Hollywood, like you were saying, Jennifer, just gravitas and in, in presence and command of the of the stage and command of the scene. That sort of uh, uh, magnetic, charismatic strength and the, the history of li literally physically being an athlete and muscle bound and just strength mixed with such uh, charm in humor and a sense of uh, investigation, wanting to know what was going on behind the scenes, wanting to be a director, wanting to to dig deeper. Um, there's so much about him that was legendary, that was larger than life, but also he also just has uncle vibes of like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I need advice on life. Uh, I, I could go to uncle Carl mm -hmm. kind of vibe. He, he's, he had that relatable legend, which I think is part of what's magnetic about him of, of, I think it's very powerful when somebody is extremely famous and seems truly legendary, truly larger than life, but also seems like somebody that you could just call <laughs> for help because your car broke down and uncle Carl would, would show up mm -hmm. like that mix of legendary and relatability uh, was powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go, go ahead, Ken. Do you have a thought on that? No, yeah. There was the what, what, and I apologize. There were so many people who were on the Lucasfilm team or on these productions uh, that were sharing stories. And one of them was like his first day was at the craft services and he took two cookies and a scoop of ice cream and kind of made a, a, a ice cream sandwich on his own. And he hears this bo voice behind him going, ice cream sandwich. And it was Carl Weathers. And he, goes, and he just, Carl was so happy and like, yeah. And I think that's what you do. It's the, one of the biggest stars you've been around. And he's like, ice cream sandwich, man. Good job. <laughs> I just love you know, that. That's yeah. the kind of stuff. Talk about relatable. Um, yeah. And then I, I, I think this is something that that was really powerful to me and all the behind the scenes stuff that we'll talk about where he seemed like he was, again, like really interested in digging uh, deep into the idea. And it was something that as I read up on more of his life and more of his choices, um, I think he's somebody that you could easily put in a box. He was an 80s action star, muscle bound, tough guy. And I don't think he ever did anything to say, I'm not that, but I think he had a lot to say. That isn't all that I am. I have more to offer than that. We're going we're gonna to talk about this more about how some of the Arrested Development character stuff was his idea. Um, uh, I was uh, looking at the, the uh, movie he did in 88, Action Jackson, and discovered that was his idea. And there's a lot in there that subverts uh, expectations. And I think that's part partially what's just so powerful about him is to say, Yep, I I am what you see, but I'm but I'm more than that uh, as well. Um, mm -hmm. You both mentioned his uh, his Twitter bio, so I wanted to be sure to share uh, share that or his Twitter presence. His Twitter bio is mm -hmm. "Digging Life's Martini with a Twist of 21st Century Consciousness." Yeah, that really yeah. speaks to what what both of you uh, yeah. have been saying. That's crazy. That's funny. That's great. yeah. Um, mm. So. We always form strong bond with performers and artists that we like, obviously, and, and it's very sad when a legend passes away. Uh, but for me, there is a there is a different kind of heartbreak. I have to just be honest when an artist passes while they're in the midst of creating. Um, Ken, are you affected in that same way? And if so, how, how do you process the difference between like a 
a 97 year old legend who hasn't made a public appearance in 15 years versus yeah. somebody who is in the middle of still creating. I, yeah. Yeah. That that's it. That's it. And then what we were talking about, I mean, I think I was looking at one of his tweets like one or two days before and, and I was uh, on a live stream uh, Friday when uh, this uh, news broke and it was in the chat and it just like, we stopped the show straight away and we're just, we had to deal with it. It was, um, it's similar. We talk about the Ray Stevenson one. I, I hadn't followed Ray Stevenson's career as close, very aware who he was, but uh, seeing the life, seeing the joy, seeing what he felt at Star Wars Celebration London, and then and, and just knowing that that f that light was extinguished so fast and so suddenly, it just it's an extra kind of heartbeat, uh, heart, heartbreak, which, which um, doesn't mean you know, hey, if you are ninety seven and it's <laughs> less sad, but there's a little bit more of. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's been done, and there's there was an energy with Carl of it's still going, and and I think it it, it trips you up. I, I'm, I, you know, I, I've I, I got to admit I had a little bit of thoughts about my own mortality this weekend because of it. Just thinking of his age, go well. That's I, I ain't far from that. <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm closer to that than than wh where I was. So uh, you know, who do I want to be? And, and I'm in that period of my life of like, who who, who am I? Who do I want to be? What do I want to do? And um, you know, I'm not planning on going soon, uh, God willing. But like, there so I, that that hits you hard too, where you're just like, he the the foot was on the gas pedal, and mm -hmm. uh, when I pull back, uh, you know, I, I'd love to go that way versus any other way. But it just is a special kind of gut punch. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, Jennifer, what do you think about the um, you know somebody passing while they're, they're in the midst of creating, and how do you process it? I think it's terrible all around. I still have never, I haven't recovered from uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who I just oh, I was just so inspired by his work, and and with with Carl Weathers, immediately when any anybody dies, I want to know. How, why did we know that he was ill? Did he have a heart condition? Like, I want to have an answer for why they were taken so soon because he mm. seems like so full of life. I'm like, how does this happen? And I get really, really emotional. And I too can start thinking about my own mortality. Yeah. Um, and like, you know, thinking about how, how little time we have. And somebody on TikTok did this where they like, they actually graphed um, how many days a person has in their life and they filled in each little square and you see it. And it's like, oh my gosh, like it's, it's filled. There's yeah. not, no, nah, right. Yeah, so I true. really started having <laughs> um s some big crises. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm surrounded by death a lot, sad to say, because I have a large family. Mm. Um, so mm. I'm constantly faced with this. And I think that what was wonderful and inspiring about Carl Weathers is that he kept going and he was working and he was so full of life and he still embraced technology in spite, you know, in spite of his age, mm. which a lot of older people don't. Right. Mm. And it's just like uh, he just was you know, with people, the craft services, ice cream, just being involved and being social. That's so, so important um, to live our lives that way. And I think it's becoming harder and harder. Anyways, I could go down an existential uh, dread. <laughs> I could too. I could too. Rant. Ken and you and I were, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> we're like on the he, same thing. He, he, he was about 30 years older than me. And this is my 30th high school anniversary year. And I'm like, well, that wasn't a long time. <laughs> it's not a long time. <laughs> Right? Sorry. It's not a long time. <laughs> We're going to existential for the center. Oh, well, I mean, I, I think it is um appropriate <laughs> yeah. when we're honoring somebody who passed. Like, you know, mm. the, this this question is existential dread question. So thank you for uh for embracing it. Uh you have to. Yeah. Um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, I it, it I, I think I felt in a way my reaction was so strong to not only the character of grief karga. But the fact that he was so excited in the behind the scenes to be directing and so excited mm -hmm. to be like, kind of wanted to do this for a long time. And now I'm doing it. And, you know, it's it's never too late to mm -hmm. do new things and to try new things. Um, and, and I think that's part of what hit me so hard. Of This is a, a performer that I love to uh, who I felt like you're, you're just getting started, man. You know, mm -hmm. you've had an amazing career, but also you're just getting started. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that. The, uh, all the existential dread realities of we only have so much time. Mm. And uh, I think mm. I if I've found any solace in the sadness, in the existential dread, 
social media has been this extremely weird reflection of what do you truly value? And when someone passes, there are reactions <laughs> to the life that you have led. Mm -hmm. And there are some performers I love who I look, I, I love Jerry Lewis and he was a complex, complex figure. And he had, he had pissed off a lot of people in the last couple of years of his life with some really insensitive quotes, but throughout his life, he had been um, a, a, a really damaged, really challenging figure. There was there were some of us comedy fans who were happy to raise a glass, but <laughs> <laughs> the response to the man's passing was sad on social media. Um, mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. contrast, that with with somebody like Carl Weathers, like everybody has a happy memory, whoever encountered him, of a kind thing that he said to him, said to them. Here, here is a, a, all these life lessons of be who you are and and be even more than what people think you are keep creating to the end of your life and just like it, jennifer with that like sort of tick tock of, of filling your days i i really try to be aware of like if <laughs> is this what i want to be thinking about on my deathbed if not <laughs> should i be doing it today yeah, yeah. If, if i wouldn't want it to be what people say about me the second i die do i want to spend any time on it <laughs> at all like you know he got in a in a yeah. Twitter spat. He did this petty yeah. thing. Like no, I, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, so you. anyway, that's my contribution to existential dread center. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, uh, final thing I'll say is I, I've been on this kick a while, um, partially processing uh, my my father in law passing away uh, with uh, some creative ambitions left unfulfilled. Of uh, I have a lot of baggage from various reasons about. Uh, you want to be an entertainer, you want to have a podcast, you want to do this. There's ego involved in that. Oh, what, 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 is, what do you need to show off? Why do you need everybody to see you? Um, and I think the contrast to that is like art is a gift you, you give to others. And like how happy are we for every bit of creation that uh, Carl Weathers contributed? Mm -hmm. How happy is his family? You know, mm -hmm. how, how great is it as Star Wars fans that we have Grief Karga? So it's also a reminder to me that I, I really do think it's a good way to think about art is, yep, it's for the people who create it, but it's also a gift to others. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well said. Um, so uh, we want to spend some time on some overview and some existential crisis. <laughs> we also want to look back on uh, on Carl Weathers' career and our relationship of it, with it. So Jennifer, when did you first learn of, of Carl Weathers? Was it specific movies or roles or was it just Cult, cultural osmosis uh being alive in the 80s in particular that caused yeah. you to discover him i think it was that and i think that you know obviously i knew rocky i saw rocky many many years ago um predator right like it, he just was a part of of the of the talk people would talk about him a lot he was a, a presence and i didn't really know too much about him but it's like mm -hmm. David Hasselhoff or like a lot of these people from the 80s where it was just like, oh, yeah, he's just he's a star. Right. He's mm -hmm. just he's a movie star. That's mm -hmm. how I interpreted that. So, yeah, he was just kind of always around. And it's, it was interesting to see how his which we'll talk about how his career kind of evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ken, what was your relationship? Was it in the cultural osmosis or did you uh, watch Rocky for uh, on VHS 1000 times? Uh, I watched uh, Rocky IV in the theaters in 1985. Ooh. That's much like how Return of the Jedi was technically my first, uh, well, not technically, New Hope was in a drive-in theater, but Return of the Jedi was how I got introduced to everything. And then you go back and it all just becomes one mishmash of memories. But yeah, Rocky IV was my first Rocky in the theater. Uh, you know, James Brown living in America, singing that, Apollo Creed, and then Apollo Creed dies in the ring. And at that... Ooh, that that was a tough one for me because I'm I'm you know nine ish right yeah no, and I'm like it's a documentary to me at this point you know I'm like throw the towel rock I was I was moved I was in I was I was scared I had a, Apollo Creed kind of intimidated me he's so larger than life and Carl Weathers was so cut and just uh, looked great there and then you know you got America in the eighties and, and uh, Russians and me with my background it was it was it was a I I was obsessed with Rocky Four. Uh, then you go back and you fill in the story, and then you, you see it all, and, and and it was from there. Then Predator, I was, I was a you know big fan of the first Predator as a kid. So there's all that. So I was right there in the middle for that 
for those big movies and him as Apollo Creed, just uh, such a larger than life character, um, uh, visually just imprinted on my, my head as, as a kid and, and also taught me a little bit about tragedy. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's like Bambi's mom, Optimus Prime dying a year later, <laughs> Nanta the Ewok and Apollo Creed. It, 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 it stuck with me. It stuck with me. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm jealous of you having got the full experience because uh, you know we've talked a lot, Ken, about the the ways that your parents you know restricted you, uh, He Man mm-hmm. figures being confiscated for mm-hmm. <laughs> religious examination, mm-hmm. which still cracks me up. <laughs> uh, towards the middle of the '80s, when when a lot of the movies did get a little bit more, they're kind of marketed to kids, but they're also extremely violent. Uh, mm-hmm. My mom kind of had a freak out, and she was like. Fantasy violence only. I'm not going to try to take Star Wars with you. And, and <laughs> if it's a laser sword, you can watch heads fly. Yeah. But if it's real world violence and like some of the action, the movies mm. of the eighties you watch now, like that's not real world violence. That's, you know, <laughs> so I was not allowed to see things like mm. uh, mm-hmm. Rocky or predator. So mm. Carl Weathers exists in my imagination is this like mythical being that I was told about on the playground apollo creed mm. existed is this like uh, in, in, in it, it that was so the height of um of the fear of russia mm-hmm. and i remember kids mm-hmm. telling me i'm like apollo creed one of the most powerful mm-hmm. <laughs> men in america mm-hmm. murdered by a russian and it was just like so like large in my imagination you know and yeah. didn't actually see it until you know i was 30 or whatever um <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then one of the other big this it's so weird the way things find you, uh, but uh, you know as an avid comic book collector in 1988, uh, Action Jackson comes out, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it was uh, in my memory it was all over in in comic book ads the big ads for Action Jackson, and the movie isn't actually a James Bond riff but he's in the tux, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like right. I want to see Action Jackson it looks like a James Bond movie and I'm not yeah. allowed to go uh, see that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I'd never watched it. I watched it this weekend and it was fascinating. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Cause there's a lot about it. That's just this big eighties action movie with like some over the top dialogue, over the top humor. Um, but it was also Carl Weathers doing, you know, w- what he did in so many instances where the initial idea was his and he wasn't just like an action hero. He also had like, a law degree i think from like harvard and like initially he's not carrying a gun mm-hmm. and he's he's been busted down for for doing the right thing and he's he, he like and there are all these characters in the film who are kind of fulfilling some of the stereotypical action roles but then very very pointedly have something different mm-hmm. and more and pushing past the stereotype so uh yeah. that that was a little bit of my my journey this weekend as well as back in the past that's fascinating. On the uh, yeah, Action Jackson's a little. I, I'm very aware, but a little less on my watch screen. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Yeah. No. Understandably, it, it was a punchline for a for a long mm-hmm. time. It's like I need yeah. to yeah. see this. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, obviously, one of his huge roles, which introduced him to a new generation of of uh, people, and really where I got to see him as an actual performer, not just a legend whispered to me by playground friends in comic books. Uh, was Arrested Development. And there was a a quote from the creator of Arrested Development being shared uh, around social media this weekend that initially uh, the creator of Arrested Development wanted Carl Weathers to just do some Rocky parodies. And he called up Carl Weathers and said, hey, do you want to do this sitcom? And Carl was like, it's not going to be just a bunch of Rocky jokes, is it? (laughs) And he's like, no, 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 it's not. Uh, And and the quote is that Carl Weathers told uh, Arrested Development creator that that he wanted to do something different, that Carl Weathers was a director, he was good at comedy, he wanted to do something different and actually pitched the idea of, oh, what if I play myself, but I was really cheap. <laughs> <laughs> and the famous recurring bit of Carl Weathers teaching acting classes, but really just trying to find uh, scraps to make stew. <laughs> <laughs> so freaking funny. It's born. So funny. What uh, Jennifer, what is what was uh what is <laughs> meaningful so or powerful to you about that reoccurring mm-hmm. bit or the fact that it was Carl Weathers saying, No, I'm not just gonna do a parody of the Rocky movies. I, I have more to offer. It's the the bit, and there is a clip that was going around that I rewatched. <laughs> it is so freaking funny. I could watch it over and over again where he's so fixated on getting a piece of bone for his stew. Yeah, yeah, the one with the, I didn't even touch my per diem. 
<laughs> like, there's a lot of meat on that bone. You got yourself a stew. You put that together. Oh my gosh. And I think it really highlights how funny he was. Mm-hmm. Is that like, mm-hmm. I think prior to that, I can't remember. I mean, uh, just like that, to be able to be as funny and as committed to that bit as he was, it just was like, wow, this this he's an actor. He's not just an action hero, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And it also shows like that the his directing side to be able to go to to admit was it Mitch Horowitz where yeah. he was like, uh, no, I have an idea of how I think this should be. You know, he mm-hmm, and I like that mm-hmm. confidence that he had that too. Although at the time, I think Arrested Development, I'm trying to remember, like it was not a huge mega success, so they could take mm-hmm. like that risk back in the day. But it's just it's just so freaking funny. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And you and I mm. quote it relatively often. It's it's one of those things. It's not just a joke. It's not just a funny. It's like a touchstone of like a joke that becomes a way to understand the world somehow in a it, weird way. It really does. And I, I am a big fan of Arrested Development. And, it, you know, there's some stuff in the rearview mirror of behind the scenes that I know is out there that maybe should be dealt with and discussed and has been at times. But um, th- that was such a, uh, just such a pop culture. And you're right, Jen, it wasn't, you know, that was part of the show's l- legacy and its own lore. It wasn't mm-hmm. well received <laughs> critically. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, yeah. well, crit- it would win some awards, but people weren't watching. And, yeah. but if you were watching, you were in. And I still, I, I still, Liza Minnelli and Carl Weathers. Oh my gosh. Are, yes. are, those are timeless performances <laughs> of, of, so of people who, who were uh, aware of what the, the aura of, of who they just, what their aura is and, and, and playing with it and playing against it and, and finding new wrinkles in it. I think that's why. And, and I'm a fan. I, I, I'll throw in too, like his, his comeback. And he had done a lot of TV between Action Jackson. Uh, in the movie Hurricane Smith and 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 1996, but it, it, Happy Gilmore is one of my favorite movies. Oh, I'm not yes, a huge course, Sandler yes. movie guy. I, I, I'm not super familiar with the Sandler verse, um, right. especially then. But Happy Gilmore was my. I love Happy Gilmore, and and him as Chubbs Peterson. That is, I still got friends I haven't seen in 25 years, and I bet if, if they walked in right now, we would probably make a Chubbs reference within <laughs> 10, 10 minutes. And and that for me was also. Oh my God, the Predator guy! Oh, right. yeah, that was it's how it kind of worked, and then Arrested Development is next level. Mm-hmm. Next yeah. Level. Oh yeah, I, I've never seen Happy Gilmore, uh, which is a, a weird, uh, you know, break in my film knowledge that I should probably fill in, and probably will want to uh, now that I'm really focused uh, on celebrating <laughs> Carl look, Weathers. Look, t- time does a lot of weird things to comedies, so I always put that caveat up, but it's worth it just for Carl Weathers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I, I, I was just so taken with this uh, this quote about uh, in this story about no he wanted to do this and um, mm-hmm. I think it's just uh, we've talked a lot uh, over the years about sort of the the gift and the curse of the personal brand that um, mm-hmm. it's great mm-hmm. when people know you for something and it isn't so much like you know me for the wrong thing it's more like the curse of the personal brand is but I am more than that. And that's, I think, what I just kind of keep obsessing over. It it wasn't like, I'm not an action hero. I'm not an athlete. (laughs) It was just like, I'm more than that. And and Mm -hmm. this role, uh, making fun of himself and advocating for himself is just uh, such a a powerful sort of pushback on the the curse part of the personal brand. Mm -hmm. And then just in terms of, like, comedy... um, I, I don't know how much of it was Carl Weathers. I don't know much, how much is the writing staff. The joke of a famous actor who is maybe on hard times making fun of themselves is that that's good. That's great. The lesser version of that joke, the easy version of that joke is, you know, somebody takes Carl Weathers acting class and finds out Carl Weathers is actually down on his luck and is desperate to stretch food out. The lesser version of that is Andy's pissed about it. That mm-hmm. this is what the world has done to me. This is what I've come to. Part of what makes that that golden to me is that he's so happy about it. <laughs> that he's so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it isn't just he's optimistic <laughs> in some sense. Yeah, it's like it's got meat on the bone, so I guess I gotta take it home and I'll, you know, right. stew again tonight. That would have been funny, but deeply <laughs> hysterical in the just uh, you know, catalog of comedy bits for the ages. Maybe you got yourself a stew going, the joy of it. Yeah, That's also yeah. just like a great like life perspective of like instead of focusing on <laughs> the most negative aspect of this situation, mm-hmm. <laughs> being like, it, it's sort of like a, hey, 
I don't have to take my car uh, to the wash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love mm-hmm. rain. You know, it's just. Rain. Yeah, it's like a delusional right. character. Yeah. 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 Baby, you got a rain going. You, I'm, yeah. I'm laughing almost <laughs> uncontrollably because I don't I don't have the quotes, and I'm always bad with quotes, but I don't have the quotes. I, don't, I just this is a big paraphrase memory. But when when David Cross's character first meets him and and, and Carl Weathers clicks in that he could take this guy for fifteen hundred dollars to act. <laughs> it's, it speaks to the joy you're talking about. And that's and that's where it clicks in right from the beginning. They're just like Oh yeah, I can take this guy's money. <laughs> oh, die. die. Yeah. Oh, so great. I'm gonna watch a super cut of uh, of this dude. Like, seriously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so <laughs> given given uh, all the roles he'd play he's played and all the different relationships with that different fan bases had with him, from Happy Gilmore to Arrested Development to Predator to to Rocky, uh to Action Jackson, what was the power of bringing him? into star wars with the mandalorian jennifer what i thought was interesting when i when i'm thinking about them on the stage you know with Pe- pedro pascal gina uh was there as well he had like you're saying he had this gravitas about him you know and so he brought his legacy but he also brought like a mainstream appeal to this star wars show, show that was basically going to be launching disney plus right this was a huge huge deal and i remember people who weren't too familiar or had not really stayed with star wars were like oh that new show has carl weathers like he really did attract a larger audience um and and he did bring he got kind of brought some class <laughs> right mm-hmm. to the world of star wars which i really i really appreciated that um and i just knew w- with him there it was going to be good it was going to be fun. That to me was why I was like, okay, I wasn't, I wasn't sure about Gina and her acting ability, but I was like, well, at least Carl Weathers is there. I love Pedro Pascal. It's going to be all right. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be yeah. all right. Ken, what did you, what do you think he, he brought in that sort of uh, announcement really even? It was it's wonderfully surreal, right? It was wonderfully surreal. And it, a lot of it has to do with this, um, I, I won't refer to it as just simply a comeback. And in this one might have been more of a comeback than Happy Gilmore or Rest of This one was like he was kind of winding down his acting career. Maybe, you know, he's, he's spoken of, about that. And so you could say that, but it was more than that. It, it was and – and I think The Mandalorian overall has done a great job of this. And I think Star Wars TV has as well. But The Mandalorian and, – and we can make the Johnny Favs pulling in 90s sketch comics and – and going outside the box, you know, it, it's more than just a pop culture checklist. It, there's something I like about it of saying this is a big galaxy, a big saga. Who can contribute to that? Who can bring mm-hmm. uh, things to it? And 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 there is uh, – I, I, I go two directions with it, and it goes beyond just Carl, but – it, this, I, I go to, I, I'm not a huge Tarantino fan. I could give or take him. I love some of his movies, don't watch a lot of them, whatever. But I do like that he's someone who goes and says, who's that? Act? Travolta still got something in the tank. Why did, mm-hmm. why did the city write him off? Michael Keaton ain't done. Mr. Mm-hmm. Mom ain't done. Mm-hmm. And, and that's powerful. And then you also saw it this past week at the, at the Grammys, 80 years old, recovering from a brain aneurysm. You got Joni Mitchell and you got Brandi Carlisle uh, telling her, uh, you know, the last five years, you're not done. Yeah. And 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 as we face our existential dread, just being able to, you know, see John Williams on stage and all that stuff. It, I, I think there was this fun, kitschy. Oh, my God. Chubbs is in Star Wars. Apollo <laughs> Creed's in Star Wars. Sergeant Al, Al Dillon's in Star Wars. That's amazing. Just like we all react to Christopher Lloyd's in Star Wars and mm. all that stuff. And, and not everyone loves it. You know, I, I get it. I get it. Um, but I think it's powerful because we're Star Wars fans. It's almost like you're like you're in the club. And, and Carl had that energy. Yes. Uh, Ray Stevenson had that energy celebration of, oh, my God, I'm in the, this is the club. This club mm-hmm. feels great. And as we as fans, I, I really think we should, uh, you know, celebrate that. That's what we do as Star Wars fans. But, I, I, yeah, there was just something so surreal to, to, to see and celebrate. And and combining from his history, athlete, played for the Raiders. He didn't, he didn't have a long NFL career, so I didn't even know him much as an athlete. He was a big college uh, football player. Action story, like I said, epitome of 80s action. Mm-hmm. The big over the top, which, which at some point got left behind, right? Right. Uh, that was the part. Bruce Willis and Die Hard was part of the nah average street cop with with average biceps is now the hero. That was part of the sea change. So yeah. so Carl Weathers could have been a relic of that time. But to take all that to take that big, you know, you have Luke Skywalker right. on one side, and you have Apollo Creed on the other. Well, they, <laughs> they, they could be together. They could, it, it, and you aren't who they say you are. And I think that was some of that. That was the big energy. That's what kind of emerged. But just him on stage, Chicago, twenty nineteen. He even he had that. 
whoa, I can't believe I'm here. You can't believe I'm here, but we're here. Uh, and that's what I think I'll always take from that and him being in Mandalorian. Hmm. Yeah. No, I really, I really agree. I think that that initial announcement uh, was such a murderer's row of legends from all different parts of our entertainment world, right? To have mm -hmm. Werner Herzog, Nick Nolte, Giancarlo Esposito, uh, mm -hmm. and Carl Weathers. It, it was part of this just like unbelievable announcement of <laughs> uh, legends from from different you know walks of the entertainment life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think what was really powerful about Carl Weathers in specific is. You know, he Werner Herzog, people love his films. They have a relationship with him. And Nick Nolte is, you know, not only a, a storied actor, but kind of has this sort of legendary, like, guy who's fallen apart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, 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 jokes about him. <laughs> Carl Weathers had this sort of just uh, endless wave of love uh, mm -hmm. of that people had clearly bonded with him. And I think uh, this was further cemented by watching some of the behind the scenes stuff, the Disney gallery, which we'll talk about. But I really respond to what you were saying, Jennifer, of he brought some validation uh, and it was sort of validation to me in like two directions, because it was like, here are two things from the 80s that if you grew up in the 80s, Rocky way over here and Star Wars way over here. And the idea that these sort of icons of the 80s could come to come together. And by the time that you know, Carl Weathers is being announced for Star Wars. I think, you know, he's a living legend and it's sort of this le living legend is uh, agreeing to be in Star Wars. But then hearing Carl Weathers talk about his experience with Star Wars going, there's so much in Star Wars that I didn't fully appreciate. I liked mm -hmm, it, but mm -hmm. I didn't fully appreciate it. And it's just it's this beautiful uh, back and forth validation between the living legend and the legend that he was now a part of in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Love that. Love the appreciation. Yeah. He brought the understanding. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and about the character of Grief Karga, uh, but we're going to take a quick break. Uh, but first we got our recommendation, right, Ken? That's right. We're celebrating Grief Karga next and continuing to celebrate Carl Weathers, but you can celebrate Asajj Ventress, that's right. By checking out Dark Disciple, the book that everyone is talking about by Christy Golden, as they should. Nine years later, the book's getting a second life, and I love that for Christy Golden as well. Download your free audiobook today by going to audibletrial.com slash four center. Try Dark Disciple by Christy Golden out on us at audibletrial.com slash four center and get your free audiobook and support the show in the process. All right, we are gonna we're gonna get a stew going. We're gonna come back, <laughs> we're gonna laugh, maybe even cry, and celebrate Carl Weathers here on Four Center. All right, we are still here. Uh, I love the, I, you know, we're not going to mention the video transition every time, but as when I put the episodes up and I edit, I just, we all do a great job of just freezing like we're in an improv game. <laughs> and, and then the commercial comes back. Uh, uh, freeze, tableau. All right, uh, Joseph, uh, thanks for uh, leading us through and, and uh, you know, getting me laughing on just the memories of uh, yeah. with us here. Yeah, uh, hilarious and powerful stuff. And we're not done uh, being both sad and laughing as we talk about the character of grief cargo we're going to start with the big picture ken for you what is interesting or powerful about the character of uh grief cargo i'm going back to when i immediately you know again the anticipation for carl weathers and star wars pretty high at this point when the series debuts in uh fall 2019 and then it it exceeded expectations uh just his presence mando everybody in here hates you all those big moments mm -hmm. in the energy he brought but then to bring the heart to the, the comedy of, hey baby do your little do your little thing and then the turn that he goes through it just i don't know it just spoke to the big themes of of mandalorian it, it, it just spoke to uh a lot of what we talked about about having coming to a realization of the power of this saga the power of this myth uh, and that you, it can, it, the sea change can happen at any point. And you, uh, Grief Karga represented all that to me and is fun uh, to watch. And also in a series, you know, we know um, Favreau has that style, uh, that that um, the pulp the pulp dialogue, that where sometimes mm -hmm. it's a little, it does come off a little clunky. I get it. Sometimes even I, I rub up against it. it. It never, for me, never had that feeling with Carl Weathers. Even when he's at hologram and just kind of like throwing three dollar words out and just to, and just kind of it's stilted and a wonderful it was special delivered from him it's it, it just going to season one and even where he ended up uh and then just w to watch the character get 
the cape get bigger and bigger. The droids carrying the capes getting bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. But it never came from uh, like ego. It it's, it seemed to represent a, a a powerful growth and someone who who grew into this position, changed, didn't want to hang out in the bar with his pirate friends anymore because that was not the way of it. Um, so even though grief was still grief, he wasn't a he was he was a good leader, but he wasn't a quiet, meek leader. He was who he was. Uh, you know, and 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 it it worked for me on a very Star Wars level. Yeah, mm. Jennifer, what yeah. was you? What was powerful or interesting to you about the character of Grief Karga? I loved that flashy side of him, like you're saying, Ken, like with the cape and the droids wheeling behind him. He liked being kind of out there with the people, which very much for me felt connected to who mm-hmm. Carl Weathers was. Right, like it's very mm-hmm. charming person but yeah when we we're first introduced to the character i was like oh this is really this is really interesting who's this guy gonna be can we trust him can we not right mm-hmm. um but i really i i grew to every episode work that he was in it was like oh it's gonna be okay you know he became mm-hmm. like this kind of like this the safety zone for for our heroes um and knowing that he was going to be there for them and being loyal and really trying to better his community it was really it was really beautiful to see that evolution of that character mm-hmm. yeah no I, I really agree uh with both of you i think there are just so many elements that it is a unique character but the more i thought about it a lot of what i admire about carl weathers was really brought to this character mm-hmm. of Grief Karga, where um, he is multi-layered. He is, if you just yeah. strip it down, he is very relatable. He is, you know, he, he isn't a, a Palpatine or a Vader sort of motivated by personal animus. He's a person on the fringe of society who's looking out for number one. And he's got that just like straightforward in season one. Like, what? I'm looking out for number one. It's a hard galaxy. Every government I've known has failed me. I'm getting by. What are you, what are you gonna do? Um, in, but then when the possibility of change presents itself, he doesn't shy away. And he has that bravery to actually change. Uh, and and he changes in such a great way. I, I think Grief Karga does kind of have a, a complete arc. He changes in that he says, here are all the things that I value mm-hmm. of feeling like a leader, being theatrical and flamboyant and strong and powerful and a voice and a leader and all these things. I don't have to lose any of that. If I have a massive shift in who I am from being mm-hmm. out for number one to saying, actually there's much more strength in community. You know, mm-hmm. I, I was going to turn this little baby in cause I'm out for number one and this baby for no reason saves my life, heals me. He, he has this moment where he can change. And I think there are a lot of us in life where those those moments present itself where we could change and we're afraid we'll lose something and we don't. And to have such a brave character who says, I'm not going to lose anything that's great about me by rising to this opportunity to change and see the value in community and see the value in working together and taking a risk and being vulnerable. Um, the contrast between the character who sits in that bar saying, they all hate you, Mando, <laughs> mm-hmm. to the character who's saying, it's a school now, and I'll defend that, mm-hmm. is, you know, it's great. And then, But then throughout it, he's the same character, right? He's super funny. Uh, the high magistrate bit is super funny. He, he's mm-hmm. super uh, theatrical with the monologues and the cape and it made him <laughs> such a great exposition machine. Like, yeah, oh, a, yeah, a couple of those speeches would just be like, it's funny because it's funny and it works because the character of Grief Karga is an exposition machine. It's like, what, you got a speech? <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. It's, yeah, so great, so powerful. Um, we have uh, already checked off in, in our description of why we love Grief Karga, some of his great moments, but I want to be sure mm-hmm. to have the opportunity to highlight some more. Uh, Jen, do you have any favorite Grief Karga moments? Yeah, the the come on baby, do the magic hand thing is so funny. <laughs> and it it shouldn't work in Star Wars, it sh- but it, it should right? Work. It should not work, but it works mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he's delivering that line. Mm-hmm. Like it just it, oh my gosh. It, and that's what I think was so fascinating was he brought he brought the comedy. He brought the comedy and then there's also the contrast where he was able to take down the space pirates, right? Where we see mm-hmm. this real kind of like western showdown moment and I believe that too. So yes, he can be funny in this other instance, but he can also be tough when he needs to be. And I thought that was just such a great great character that we don't always get in Star Wars where they can ha- play those uh, two sides of the coin. 
Yeah, no, the the magic hands is a highlight, and I love that you brought up that it shouldn't work because I think it feels too meta. It feels yeah. uh, mm -hmm. too self aware of you know, mm -hmm. hey, if, if the force is real, you know, this is the kind of things we would say. But I think he just sold the honesty of that. Of he's just sort of like, the baby healed me, then he held back flames. This baby can do anything. Why would mm -hmm. it? <laughs> It's the right. way my brother uh, reacted to Luke Skywalker being too powerful in Return of the Jedi when we uh, started playing with our action figures. Uh, it, it, my brother set up this whole scenario where uh, the action figures were stuck on a furniture planet and they were on the dresser <laughs> and he, he wanted them to get to the bed and he was going to have like Han Solo fire a grappling hook. And I was like, Luke can just levitate everybody. <laughs> my brother got real mad about it. He's like, so they're just no problems now, I guess, because Luke Skywalker has a force. <laughs> No other problems exist. And there, there's something that is like meta that works. Of He doesn't know the limitations yeah. of the force. It's just like, get the baby to do it. Like, mm -hmm. do the magic hands. Um, the other thing I love mm -hmm. about that is, come on, baby, do the magic hands thing is so funny that I always forget that it's followed up by the great banger of when when Grogu doesn't respond, <laughs> Grief Cocker just says, I'm out of ideas. Right, right. <laughs> it's a one-two one, two, one. That's amazing. It's a real one-two one. Uh, I have some other thoughts too, Ken, but I want to know what, uh, any favorite grief cracker moments yeah, from you. Yeah, we're highlighting a lot of them in general, just his vibe, his presence, those moments, especially in season one before the transition. And I was thinking about the chapter three, right, which is the Deborah Chow directed uh, mm. Sin episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's something I like because he's still a great. And it was interesting, I, by the way, I think to, you know, the show begins and it's like grief. You said it, Joseph, like gr grief is kind of a. Bagger or Jen, you were touching about it too, right? Where are we where are we at with him? Because we mm -hmm. want to love Carl Weathers, right? right <laughs> we want to love right. anything he's doing, but we're not necessarily rooting for him. He hasn't made all the decisions yet. I love that episode. I love uh, that uh, the sin is is uh, in part committed against him, or at least he's aware of the sin. And and there's a, that moment at the end where he's kind of like confronting Mando, and he's got his little 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 holdout blaster, and it's just one on one. It's such an '80s moment to me. Right, mm -hmm. it is such the 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 villain shows up at the end, and is like I got you, and the hero still gets away, and the, and I I thought I in the moment I thought maybe well that was it you know that was mm -hmm. it right, uh, right you know and then he's he's saved by the, the was it the 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 credits right um, yeah yeah oh, saved yes, saved right. by his <laughs> greed if mm -hmm. you want to look at it's it that great. way he puts the best guy yeah. next to his puts heart and it saves yeah. him yeah, yeah saves yeah. him but there's some just. He was perfect for that. It's mm -hmm. such a small moment in the great, you know, Mando, everyone hates you. All that, we can go to all that, but like, and those are such wonderful moments we've already discussed. But I just love, as I was just rewatching season one, like uh, after the movie announcement, um, which it, it's just uh, tragic. We won't see Carl Weathers on the big screen uh, in, in that film. Um, but uh, mm. it's, it's such a quintessential 80s action moment mm -hmm. that he was perfect for that. It was, it was meta without even trying. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Um, the, they they all hate you, Mando. Might be one of my favorite Mandalorian lines. Might be one of my favorite Star Wars lines. There's so much in that scene, and he plays it. Again, it's funny, but it's funny because it's coming from such a place of truth. Of mm -hmm. He's giddy from the he's fact giddy. that this he's impossible giddy. job was accomplished. Mm -hmm. And he sees everything as sort of like, here's how you get by in life is you're – you're out for yourself and you, you know, you, 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 you use other people, but sometimes that could be mutually beneficial because he's like, your glory is my glory. Um, mm -hmm. But there's also that sort of like he, he's there's a there's a sense of him as a romantic and the idea of yes. station and the idea of being legend is like they hate you because you're a legend. You made yeah. yourself a legend on this job and the seeds. They all hate you, Mando. It's just a, a a beautiful line and a beautiful delivery. Just in in the way he's talking to the whole bar, like they all had a, a tracker, they all had a chance, but then they all mm. failed. He's like yelling at them all. There's so much that's funny about it, but it's also like he's rolling out all of these like kind of sad. This is all the world has to offer is money, or maybe you want a toilet <laughs> bath mm -hmm. or massage, mm -hmm. you know, like and yeah. Mando's given back to him nothing but honor, honor, honor. Right. And you can see him almost like confused by it. Yeah. But there's obviously something there because he becomes such a man of honor. And, and right. you know, by the end is given these speeches, uh, you know, to the Mandalorians about you may not have a home planet, but you have a home here on Navarro. That that scene 
becomes really important from grief Cogger's perspective because it is almost like the seed of him being willing to change and seeing all of this honor from Din Djarin. Yeah, absolutely agree. It's, it's, it's even when, when he's asked by Din about what are they going to do with him? It's like, it's, 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 it's the first moment of, of grief being like, well, I, I don't ask. You don't ask. Don't ask. No one asks. Why would you ask? Yep. And he starts to learn. Why would you ask? Yeah. Yeah. And why, why you should. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah, it's a great scene and a great line. Uh, do either of you have any other uh, grief cargo moments that you specifically wanted to highlight? I, mean, I, I love them, you know, to uh, Vane and the and the pirates and just the the old friends showing up to, to mm-hmm. do old times. That whole sequence is really fun for me, and just uh, just his entire presence in season three, including the ex- he because he's the one that's like, so you reunited with him in the book of Boba Fett, okay. <laughs> right? Okay, like, you right. completed your quest, but you're right back with him. <laughs> mm. mm-hmm. uh, and, and and I just love everything about him in, in, in season three. The, the the bigness of of yeah. the character of grief. Yeah. Uh, I'm just- glad that they didn't cover him with an alien face prosthetic as they initially were going to do it wasn't until mm-hmm. Favreau met him in person he was like oh actually no let's not do that thank god that's right. all i have to mm-hmm. say you know, yeah. we're not seeing a lot of faces on this show please <laughs> yeah 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 uh I'll, I'll shout out the he's trying to eat me moment in uh chapter seven the the reckoning <laughs> oh. the, when yeah. when grogu's coming up to him to heal him he's trying to eat me <laughs> it's great me. um it's a bittersweet line but in also in in the reckoning when he gives that big uh hollow hollow monologue where he he mm-hmm. tells din basically like hey i got a problem with the client come back here and i'll work with you we'll use a kid as bait and we'll eliminate the client <laughs> but he says you might be surprised to hear this but i'm alive too <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. great exposition yeah. and, and and final thing jennifer and ken you both mentioned the school scene but mm. that's a great grief cargo scene because it shows how far he's come and what has changed and what hasn't changed mm-hmm. um but it's also for me like it, it it crystallizes to me the largest theme of the new republic era of people are trying to change people with imagination and empathy mm are trying mm-hmm. to change. And there are all these forces who are just sort of bitter and stuck and resent change and don't want anyone to change, don't want anything to change. Don't want, it was a bar once, it's forever a bar, period. I, do, I just don't want change out of disliking change. Mm-hmm. And so to have him be totally faced with Vane saying basically like, I'm gonna start a shootout in your streets if you don't acknowledge that this is a school. Mm-hmm. And it being such a, such a place of a, a thing of honor for grief cargo of like i'm i this was a bar where i hired people to do awful things but i've changed and it's a school now and then vane accuses him of going soft and he you know pulls the blaster and basically says i haven't ends up shooting the blaster out of vane's hand in a good like sort of defensive move i'm trying not to take your life kind of thing it, just to me it, it has it's great for grief cargo but it has these rhythms of of what we've been talking about with carl weathers of it it's not that i'm not extremely a strong leader mm-hmm. but i'm more than that too and mm-hmm. i thought that was all crystallized in that scene it speaks to what i think is uh, uh one of the kind of big points uh, of contention that we see debated in the culture wars uh, daily in our own lives about this idea of, of 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 masculinity classic straight masculinity versus toxic masculinity and so many people in my life who who, who are supersized who are strong and tough uh have have trouble they're vain they're vain go but that was that was a bar and if I acknowledge it to school I lose this and they're confusing what this all means grief card is a great example of he is Action Jackson. He is the guy from Predator. He is larger than life. He could probably still have knocked you out if you needed to at 76, right? That, that's not all what we're talking about. It's how you use that and how you approach the world and that sense of community. Uh, uh, and that's why I like him being, he, he didn't become the, the high magistrate or become the low magistrate and, and wear <laughs> sandals and a dirty smock like, you know, some faux uh, humbleness like uh, the high sparrow in Game of Thrones comes to mind of like, oh, mm. me, me, but I'm really here to take over. He was like, this is me. I can't, cha- I can't make the muscles go smaller because that's who I am. Plus, I like having them. That's not the problem. The muscles aren't the problem. It's what you do with them. Mm-hmm. And, and, and and it's so key to his character and so key to Garces flip talking to Blacker Santon and all that stuff. That's why I, I think I gravitate 
it a lot. So I love you highlighting that moment. Yeah. And just the, the gravitas that he keeps just saying, it's a school now. It's it, a school it, now. Yeah. There, there ain't room for debate on that one. It's a school mm -hmm. now is, is so great. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't got a chance to really discuss uh, the loss of the, the Mandalorian and, and, and many other shows, costume designer uh, of mm -hmm. Shana Terpsik, um, who, who passed away in October of uh, 2023, where we were kind of on our strike break. So this seems like a good time to celebrate her excellent work on Grief's outfits and the ever larger capes. Uh, it's easy to just have fun with it because it's really hilarious. But Jennifer, what do you enjoy about Grief's costume choices and how his, his capes just keep getting bigger and bigger? I can I can imagine feeling the fabric. I think what was so amazing about Shauna was that she was very aware of the time period that Star Wars was created, the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so I, I read that she was actually very intentional about the types of fabrics that she used, the type mm. of technology and tools that she would use to make it seem like it would fit in with the kind of 70s Star Wars that we know. I think of, of Garza Fwip's dress, that white mm. halter neck sequin dress with the cape. It is so stunning, but it's so reminiscent of something that like from uh, the 1970s Halston designer might design. Mm. Like it's just, just the level of detail. Like she put Easter eggs in different costumes, like just brilliant. And again, 56 years old. It's not right. It's mm. not fair. It makes me so upset um, that, you know, she was in her prime creating magic on screen for us to enjoy. It's just such a loss. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Ken and I were so lucky uh, to see that uh, Mandalorian Book of Boba Fett uh, exhibit at a Star Wars Celebration in Anaheim and to see some of those costumes up close and to see the it level of detail and like the sparkle yes. in the, uh, in the armors, uh, you know, looking up close at the the red, the the crimson of her armor, and seeing the sparkle in it, and seeing the detail of the on those Garza Whip dresses is yeah, absolutely amazing. Uh, Ken, what what are your thoughts on on her work in general, but also specifically Grief's uh, evolution? Yeah, it it it, it was um, it's perfect in so many ways, and and I will say this right towards the end of the strike in early December, I got a chance to host a panel at LA Comic Con with many of the folks on her crew. They were doing a tribute panel right after Tashana Tripsik, and um, I uh, was blown away. The stories um, off stage and even on were, were spoke of community. So many people like, oh, I I had met Shauna seven years ago, and she remembered me. And she gave me a chance. I'd never worked in this. I, she gave me a chance. Uh, I she had this idea, and I had this idea, and and she let my creativity run wild, and it all kind of um, flowed into the importance of character, the importance of of character and themes shown in in outfits, shown in droids carrying a cape. <laughs> what a great little <laughs> detail that, of course, grief would have that because uh, he wants the biggest cape in the world, and it's tough for me to walk. Uh, get me some droids. Give me some cape droids. Uh, I, I was really um, uh, uh, touched by that, uh, that everyone, uh, it, it was, Shauna did, did not seem just like a department head. You know what I mean? Mm -mm. She had a family around her. And I think that uh, shown in her detail, attention to detail, all the stuff you're talking about, Jen. Um, just think of the designs. I mean, yeah, you're right, Joseph. That was the highlight of Anaheim. And you and I had that like, ah, yeah, yeah, I guess we'll get down there. I guess we'll get down there. Right? We were like, yeah, we'll mm -hmm. make time for it. I'm so glad we did. Just yeah. to see everything, the designs, the Mando display stuff was was uh, well, a special a special thing as a Star Wars fan, and, and Sean was behind that, and and it shown uh, showed uh, greatly in Greece out, outfits and costumes. Absolutely, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, if he never had anything but his first season outfit with the half cape, that would have been mm -hmm. like that is such a great example of it is absolutely classic Star Wars, but in evolution on an idea. With the, mm -hmm. you know, just kind of the the one, you know, shoulder that has the That's cape. Right. And then he comes back in the second season uh, with the kind of two uh, capes or, you know, half robe thing. Um, and at that point, it's, it's kind of funny. Oh, he got his, <laughs> he's got the other half of his cape. <laughs> uh, and then to, to have the sort of confidence that this character can be taken deadly serious and still have something about him that is uh, funny that mm -hmm. he wants a cape this big, that he needs droids to carry it. Um, you know, and, and yeah. the, the tragedy of both these passing is like, what, what would he have been floating in a, you know, half cape, <laughs> half land speeder by the time we saw him again. Um, 
And, and, and I think it's not, it's one of those kind of details that I think people in the Star Wars bubble notice and like joking about. And it is funny and the humor is part of its power to me. But it's also like, how do you read the character? Because everybody's taking their job seriously. Mm -hmm. And what does that tell us about the character? And to me, that, that tells him that he is like a great leader and he's aware that I love pomp and circumstance, but also mm -hmm. that affects how people are going to listen to me and how they're going to treat me. You know, sort of the clothes makes the person. I'm mm -hmm. projecting authority and class and Navarro isn't this sad backwater place. It's not a quick... Uh, mine those asteroids you know uh pump and dump we're all gonna leave it's a place for royalty and i'm gonna be the symbol of that there's comedy to it but there is totally like that's who the character was who had had a, a sense of the value of pomp mm -hmm. and circumstance and theater and and mm -hmm. he's dressing i think for himself and he's dressing for theater of like i'm representing navarro and it's so classy you need two droids to help carry the class that's how mm -hmm. classy navarro is now Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's who I am. That's what my culture is. That's what I bring. And and, and, and ain't nobody going to take this from me is, is the energy of Grief Cargo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Carl Weathers also did great directing work on The Mandalorian. Uh, season two's chapter 12, The Siege, and season three's chapter 20, The Foundling. Uh, Jennifer, what did you appreciate about those episodes? The in the siege, there's a lot of humor. There's a lot of action. He directed himself, right. which is never easy to do. Uh, the foundling is really fascinating. That's the one that I feel like was really talked about at the time. Obviously, because we saw Grogu's trauma, uh, mm -hmm. we saw Kelleran Beck, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was just like, mm -hmm. what? Oh my gosh, Ahmed Bestis is back in Star Wars with a character that started on a kid's game show like what <laughs> right yeah, so yeah. it's just uh, it just was such a, a dramatic and exciting moment and um yeah obviously he was the right person for the job to be able to handle these types of these types of stories it's really that's really difficult to do <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah no absolutely ken what did you think of uh, those two episodes what did you see in the in the direction of them yeah, the siege is so fun, and it and it was it. And it's one of those things that made sense at the time, right? Again, oh, Action Jackson is directing an, an action episode, and and mm -hmm. you know there was blaster fire and speeder bikes. A lot of the clips of the trailers for that episode going into the mm -hmm. season, uh, and it made a lot of sense. But again, let, you know, and that's all correct, I think. But but let's not let's not pigeonhole Carl Weathers, and he comes back with another episode full of big action. But it's this episode that's about. Uh, uh, family. It's about the next generations, but protecting the next generation. And then it was perfect. Jed, I, I, I did a little bit of. Uh, uh, I was like, oh yeah, the family. And I just brought it up on on Wikipedia again to be like, and it's like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's Ahmed Best. And I saw Ahmed Best post this weekend. Mm. I, I, I'm so glad Carl Weathers directed that episode, and that he, you take this performer. And you take this character, this wonderful new character that's all about the next generation, protect the 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 the, the choice to protect Grogu, but to be able to, to to have this almost meta comment on you know Ahmed Best and his journey, the incredible highs, the devastating near 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 you know end of the line lows, and and, and for have Carl Weathers to be like you you are not what they say about you, you are not your failures, you you are beyond that, you are yourself. And, and you still have something to add and you can still keep going and you can still be powerful. You can still be who you are and have Ahmed Best so represented in, in the design of Keller and Beck, right? The designs down to uh, the, um, the the Jedi robes have have uh, very specific things that Ahmed kind of had, had wanted put in there uh, that represent him and, 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 and uh, culture and all those things. It, it, it's, it just couldn't be more perfect. Uh, and adds to the tragedy of the loss, but as part of the legacy to celebrate that he got to direct Car uh, Ahmed Best returning. It's amazing yeah. to me. Yeah, and that post from Ahmed Best, if anybody hasn't seen it, is great about Carl Weathers being there for him, knowing this was hard to take a step mm -hmm. back into Star Wars and how much Carl Weathers was was there for him to say, you got this. Yeah. You yeah. know, which is such a, you know, not all directors are supportive directors. <laughs> no. Or would right. know how to deal with with that situation in a respectful way. Just even how the whole scenes are directed, you can tell it's like it's not that it's necessarily serious, but there's a there's a level of respect and love that I can feel in the direction. I just think that that's just really difficult to pull off, and like you're saying, not every director would be able to to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I really agree with both of you. I think there's this great evolution 
of uh, the the siege is a great '80s comedy yeah, buddy um, action movie. There's a great chase. There's great humor with uh, with Grogu. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, there's it's it's great across the board. Is like this wonderful buddy movie action comedy and Star Wars moves the overall plot forward. Great. Um, and then the Foundling is sort of this this next level it is it's probably my favorite episode of season three uh it's got the grogu flashback but the whole episode is um so centered on this focus on community and protection and that it is in in incredibly hard to be connected to people because we're gonna lose people it's hard to grow because you have to face your trauma. So the whole thing that gets established in that episode of um, the, uh, if this kid wants to be a Mandalorian, one thing you do is face your weaknesses. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we're ironing the the impurities out of the, uh, the Beskar. Mm -hmm. And while we're hammering, it's church. And you should be hearing in that ring, a siren song to face your trauma. Mm -hmm. And, at the same time, we're we're telling this story where this is the way has been potentially, you know, a, a really rigid statement of of a cult like rigid group. And it has been about violence and about not taking your helmet off. And the version of this is the way in the foundling is about being there for one another in, in saving Paz Vizsla's child. Well, Din's child, Grogu, is going through this trauma. Everything in this episode is about facing trauma and being there for one another and a, and a, a much kinder view of, of the, this, this covert of Mandalorians um, that eventually, towards the end of the season, appears to make a better choice of, of staying connected. And I think this episode really sets all of that up. And it, I'm just... Boy, I would have loved to hear Carl Weathers talk endlessly about how he approached it. Obviously, those ideas are in the script, mm-hmm. but he really brought them to life and made you feel them, that this is a different kind of strength and in, in, uh, often a harder kind of strength, which is vulnerability. Yeah, it seemed to come from from so much of his heart, too. It's, it's a perfect, you know, I don't know how that I get. Yeah, I'd love I'd love to know how they came to the decision of Carl. You you got this episode or Carl saying I got this episode, or how, how that came about. It was it was. It was it was uh, magic that it happened, and and, and seeing uh, Katie Sackoff post uh, uh, on Instagram about um, um, her and Carl sharing a love of the Pacific Northwest and family and connection and community and those kind of things, and and, and to see that at on display in that episode, mm-hmm. all that stuff's in there. Uh, I love it. I love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we've already mentioned it a couple times. Uh, some some of the quotes, but Carl Weathers featured prominently in a lot of the Mandalorian behind the scenes uh, uh, of the show Disney Gallery. Uh, that first season has like six episodes, mm-hmm. and then the, there's mm-hmm. the ones about the second and third season as well. Uh, Jennifer, do you have any favorite moments or words of wisdom uh, from Carl Weathers that you wanted to discuss from those Disney Gallery episodes? Not necessarily words of wisdom, but I thought his insight on the volume was really helpful for anybody who has criticism of the volume. But he was giving it from an an actor's perspective, but also kind of a director's perspective. And he talked about how the great thing about the volume is that you are able to see what is happening. An actor is able to instantly get into the moment, not have to just be staring at tennis balls and green screens. You know right? Lava's coming up. And the great thing is, is that if we're with other actors, they're all seeing the same thing too. Same thing, yeah. And mm. when you're a director and you're in the editing bay and you're trying to get your shots and you have one actor who's reacting like it's the scariest thing and another actor who's just more <laughs> puzzled and like, right? That is death. If yeah. the, all the actors are seeing the lava, they're going to know how to react. And yes, they might have different colors within it, but they're all it's all the same lava. And that's what he talked about. And I thought that was such a great insight, not just as an actor, but from that director's mind. That mm-hmm. and, he, and also the embracing of the technology, right? It's like even at, the, at his age, he's like, yeah, this is awesome. I love this. <laughs> yeah, there's no like, we didn't need this uh, back in my day. Right, or, you exactly. know, it, It's better when it's real, you know. Right. Uh, it was, ooh, what can be done with this? Exactly, and that's what I love about him. I, I, I love that, you, yeah, I love that you brought that up, Jen, because uh, Emily Swallow also posted a, a wonderful, and that's what they do, everyone, 
you know, posted mm. so many wonderful, warm th- thoughts uh, from the Star Wars family. And Emily Swallow posted the, that he he went to see her and Joe Morton in King Lear, which I thought of you, Whoa. Joseph. I think you saw that. One of those performances. I did. I, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I wish we went to the same show. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and she she said that he he made a point to stay after and talk about it and all that kind of stuff. But she mentioned that you know that he at times during his directing he'd express some sort of frustration with the technology, not fighting against, but just he knew that he needed to get it and he knew the value of it. But it was still frustrating and how we'd push through that. And I thought that was an interesting thing. But you totally re- reminded me, Jen, even someone as I, as I who, who has been at times critical with, with the stagecraft, the volume of, of, of how it looks and how it feels. And I, and I still think, you know, it's only going to get better and better. Um, and I have some thoughts on that. But I, I always go back in my mind to his words because it does make a lot of sense. <laughs> it does make a lot of sense. And I remember seeing some of the behind the scenes stuff and watching it with uh, my partner, Grace, uh, uh, an actor as well. And her just being blown away by some of the stuff she was seeing of like, she goes, that, cha- that changes everything yes. as a performer. And it, it is him. It is him in his 70s going, this is amazing. You know, I, you know, it, it, it's a lot easier to punch Stallone than punch a tennis ball with his face. <laughs> you know, it's important. Um, that and then and then uh, that I rewatched the Legacy episode, which I believe is uh, the second episode of that gallery. And we celebrated and talk about a lot, but it's you know it's, I don't even, I was going to write down some of the quotes and I forgot I got so pulled in the episode and that's the one with the mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. now celebrated Filoni speech about the 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 fight and Phantom Menace and how it relates to everything. Um, but Carl Weathers, both in that episode, in just as the kids say, full of riz. I think is how they say it. I'll go. <laughs> yes, to that's table. right. Yeah, yeah. He's just he's he's next level there at that table uh, with the white hat and but uh, in the cutaways of that of like. You touched upon uh, touch upon earlier, Joseph. He didn't. He didn't. He wasn't a, a Star Wars fan in seventy six or seventy seven. You know, he, he he didn't necessarily gravitate to it. Maybe he didn't feel it was for him. But it was always there, and he found it. And he you know certainly was watching it, certainly familiar. But if it, it was there for him, and you you and I back in the day, I remember Joseph just kind of leaning on that. Like this is the power of Star Wars. This is why we talk about it the way we do on Force Center. You might just show up for the the zoom zoom and the lightsabers and the clash clash, but. It's always there for you if you want to dig deeper, and it will find you when you need it uh, to, mm-hmm. to be found. And, and and to have him just say that so beautifully, again, at his age, with his experiences, his perspectives, and what what society might put on you, you know, especially in the 80s. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're a strong, muscular, f- f- fighting action man. Star Wars ain't for you. That's the nerd stuff, right? That, that's, that, mm-hmm. was, that was what was going on. And that's also what Luke Skywalker is supposed to, you know, uh, you know, as you, as you talked about so wonderfully, Joseph, kind of be standing against, not necessarily against <laughs> the people, but just the times and society. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, th- I'm throwing down my weapon. And that's the point. So, so to push past that, those boundaries and find Star Wars and find the meaning of it, uh, it, it's so important that it comes from Carl Weathers. And that's why I think we lean on those comments a lot. Yeah, no, that that's the I rewatched that moment. I scrubbed through and it's like, where was that? Because I think about it all the time. He could have just said, Oh yeah, no, I saw all the Star Wars uh the movies, you know, back when they came out and and I got it. I got that they were about something deeper. It's that that honesty and that I it's never too late to explore something differently. And he's like, I, I saw them when they're coming out, but they had a lot to say that I probably needed to hear in my twenties. And I just didn't hear it. And he, he goes on to talk about how they have this idea of the father and how you have to surpass the father. But the father is also this representation of how we're all connected. And if we're all all connected, how is that going to change what you're doing? And he's like, and then I went and read, uh, you know, The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell. And he's not talking about back in the 80s. He's saying now mm-hmm. I did not look down mm-hmm. on this thing as like, eh, this is this is a way back <laughs> yeah. to, uh, you know, to acting. This is a way to th- it was just it was that true engagement of like. I'm so engaged by these ideas. I want to explore more where they're where they're coming from and understand it, uh, how it relates to me and in my journey as a human being. That that was really powerful and great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, another one that uh, that I wanted to share is uh, it's in the uh, the uh, first season, the cast episode. Um, where they kind of start by talking about him and how uh, he, yeah, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't really thinking about acting, but they invited him back. Mm-hmm. And um, and he, he says, I did write down this quote because I wanted to get it right. He says, I always want to see the script, man. What am I being asked to do? Is mm-hmm. an actor, mm-hmm. what you're really doing is, uh, and he thinks about it for a moment, he says, you're endorsing what someone wants to say about the world. 
Mm -hmm. And I've worked with lots of different actors over the years. And some actors do not. I've worked with actors who do not want to know or care. What's the script about? They just want to understand their role. And I understand that some people approach it that way. But for me as a writer <laughs> uh, in, in, a, in a director yeah. uh, and an actor myself, I love that somebody and he goes on to say, like, what is this saying? And and a do I agree with it? Is that a thing I want to support in the world? And from an actor perspective, an actor's perspective, uh, what is my part in telling that if this whole thing is telling us a, a story about redemption, about accepting change? What's my arc in that? And how can I support that? It's just, it, it makes me uh, love him as an actor and as a human to just say, first thing is the script. And if you're saying something that I disagree with in the world, I'm not helping you say it. Is That's pretty amazing. It, mm -hmm. would, would you guys have any thoughts or reactions to that, uh, that quote? I mean, yeah, I quickly, I saw, I watched that too. And it was, I t kind of forgot that moment too. And, I, and it's great that he's kind of saying it with, with John at the table. <laughs> you know, yeah. So I was double checking what you wanted to say. Yeah. What oh, you actually wanted to say. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so it's really important in this day and age because people will associate you with the projects that you're a part of. Mm -hmm. And if you have a problematic creator, and you're you know standing by them and you're staying silent well people are going to say hey you knew this person was doing this stuff <laughs> why didn't you speak up right so uh mm -hmm. i think that that was very very smart and just again another way of showing that he was evolving with, mm -hmm. with times yeah yeah very well said uh any final thoughts on the legacy of grief karga and carl weathers as we wrap up our conversation ken it's you know this is very uh, – what, what we're saying here today and what we're feeling and what the community uh, uh, felt this past week and weekend is very real, very organic, um, meaning he was in Star Wars and it, it immediately meant so much to so many people. It, it, and this wasn't – it wasn't this, none of this is forced for me like, oh, uh, uh, Carl died. Well, I guess we better say something. I, I wanted to say something, right? Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a name – that I have I have been speaking about since 1985. Even even when he faded from the pop culture landscape, uh, this was a, a, a personal event. He shows up again, and then he shows up again, and he shows up again. But then in the final uh, years of his life, f because of Star Wars, and we we talked talked earlier about bringing people into Star Wars. When Star Wars can introduce someone to a different generation or allow us to see someone in a different way. Um, you know, it, it's generally speaking a good thing outside of maybe one or two examples individually, but, but, but like it, it was such a wonderful thing as a lifelong fan who, who watched Apollo Creed die in the ring and was, you talk about existential dread early on in life, <laughs> heart, bro, I, you know, screaming in my head, throw the towel rock, throw the towel rock to, to, to go from that and, and to learn about him as a man. Cause I think back then grown up, we didn't get to learn as much, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't have as much access. Uh, you know, you'd have to get Starlog magazine to get interviewed, but now we have, the, for better or worse, we have more access. And then you get access and you're maybe sometimes like, I wish I didn't know that about that guy. <laughs> um, Carl Weathers comes along and and passes the test, man. And, and when everything you learned and everything that was shared about him over the last couple of days by his castmates and his, and his crewmates and his friends and his family was was just beautiful. It's a loss. It's a giant loss. Uh, I say this a lot on, on on radio when 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 a, when an artist pass, but we it, we have the legacy of their work and we have the legacy of their words. And with Carl Weathers, we have the legacy of of, of his own lessons shared with us, especially the last few years. Great loss, but um, I'm blessed. I think we're all blessed to experience Carl Weathers, and and hopefully we all can hashtag be peace going forward. <laughs> Very well said, Jennifer. Any final thoughts from you? For me, it was so important, not just because of his of his legacy, but he was a, a black man who was in Star Wars, which notoriously has been very, very white. And so to see this man get to play a complicated character, a character that was not a stereotype, bringing all of his talent, his ability, going on to then directing, it just, it made me feel so happy, inspired. It made me think of the kids who are going to see him and believe that they belong in this universe. Like it just, mm. 
it means so much. And I loved that because he was this mega star, right? It shut it shut up the fans that are normally very vocal that always mm. go on their campaigns whether it's finn whether it's you know uh, moses ingram like they they were all silent because mm. what could you say about this man <laughs> you really want to say something about him go ahead <laughs> he will take you on on twitter and do it in a way that is just perfect mm. right mm. and it's just like uh, it just made me so happy every time he was on screen not just for who who he was but also what he represented for 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 those of us yeah mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. a, a very powerful very well said jennifer and i think in a, a really important uh perspective uh th this was uh it, it was weird for me on friday um i i really i had to like stop everything i was doing i was really really devastated i think part of it is uh, you know I have known of the legend of Carl Weathers for years and years, but I didn't get to see those movies. And he was a whispered legend to me. And he really, I really became aware of him as this like extremely funny, charming guy on Arrested Development. And I saw the movies, but it wasn't the same thing where like, I eventually saw the movies of my youth, but it wasn't the same thing where like, I you know saw him at a sleepover in 86 and grew up with them the same yeah. way. And, and in some ways that whole kind of world of Rocky and Predator, uh, when I was a kid represented a world that I wasn't a part of. I was scrawny and liked art and I was not a big tough man who could do big tough man things. So it was kind of like over there And the, the strength of my relationship with this idea of this man, cause I didn't get to know him in real life, obviously uh, was everything that he brought to star Wars. And I just so loved the role of Grief Karga and digging deeper and hearing more about his personal life. There's so much about Grief Karga uh, that was truly representative of Carl Weathers and things that I just think are incredibly valuable. Um, he, he represented uh, absolute uh, uh, gravitas, take him deadly seriously. And like you were saying, like you want to go after Carl Weathers <laughs> on social media? Go ahead. Uh, absolute gravitas, but along with that, just charm and compassion and valuing humor and wry, funny, winking in the no humor. Um, in that everything about the character of Grief Karga and the way that Carl Weathers approached it and communicated about it was all about dig deeper, dream bigger. It's never too late to learn. It's never too late to change. It's never too late to advocate for yourself and say, I am what you see, and I am so much more too. And I am just incredibly grateful uh, for, for getting to experience all of that uh, through the, the career of this man and his, uh, his guardianship of this character of Grief Karga. Indeed. Guardianship, indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, very uh, good and wonderful to spend some time uh, talking about him. And of course, we're, uh, you know, happy and excited to hear uh, other people's memories and, and relationships with the man and the character as we release this episode. Uh, Ken, you want to let people know where they can find us? Absolutely. We are on Twitter and threads at Force Center Pod. Our Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. We're on Instagram, YouTube as well. Subscribe over there. Uh, thank you to those that have and are, are supporting the stuff going on there. Uh, podcast is available on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. As Joseph said up top, we're re-releasing those databank data bank brawl episodes in order and there's a lot and they're going to be exclusive to the podcast feed merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash force center and you can support us directly at patreon.com slash force center uh if you join you'll get access to the 007 center coming your way on february 12th you can follow us uh you follow me i should say uh i am a collective us today uh at ken dapsock <laughs> go to my website ken uh new music uh of sorts is out uh my band the moon and moon agers just released a single of a previous uh, song the special one some bonus content bonus uh, bonus songs some mixes uh check that all out at the moonagers.bandcamp.com jen where can they uh, find it and follow you you can find my Star Wars word nerd videos, my Jim and the Holograms <laughs> video at Landa, on YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. There you go. Joseph, great job taking us through a tough but mm. needed and wanted celebration of Carl Weathers and Grief Karga. Where can they find you? 
Yeah, you can find me on all the social media at Joseph Scrimshaw, and you can check out my blog, Finish Your Monsters. It is about the creative process. I'm sharing mine to uh, hopefully uh, let people see that if you're on any kind of a uh, journey, creative journey, or any other life journey, hey, we all have ups and downs, and hopefully encourage people to keep striving for the things that they want to do in life that is uh, findable by just Googling Joseph Scrimshaw, Finish Your Monsters. There you go. That's it. All right, everybody, tonight, go get a stew on. We'll see you next time here at Force. <laughs>